Mohammed, thank you for joining us on Coffee with Polio Experts. Can you first tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do in polio eradication? First of all, thank you so much, Sona, for having me uh, for, for this uh, coffee talk. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So basically, I'm a medical doctor by training. Uh, I did advanced training in health management and uh, global health. I was uh, working for some years in the Eastern Mediterranean region uh, on, on fighting outbreaks, starting from the Syria outbreak in 2013 and 2014, and most recently to fight the vaccine-derived polyvirus in Syria uh, in, in the last year. Uh, we worked with a group of people, a magnificent group of people, on, on fighting this, this paralyzing disease there. So it's this outbreak in Syria that I want to ask you about, actually. There were 74 children paralyzed by circulating vaccine-derived polio, and I know no new cases have been detected since September 2017. Yeah. How confident are you, given the conflict, the movement of people, uh, how confident are you that this outbreak has been stopped? Yeah, actually it is a, it's a very complex outbreak happening in an area where there was war in there. Still the security situation is, is, is not stable. Uh, but definitely we are confident now that we have a stronger uh, surveillance system happening there. Uh, the immunity of the children have been built up after the, the massive campaigns that have been conducted on the ground. We have better access in terms of health access to the children. Uh, absolutely, this is uh, not only based on my personal opinion, it is based also in a group uh, of expert people who conducted an outbreak response assessment, uh, especially with, the, with them being in-country doing field visits and looking at evidence-based evidence, uh, evidence -based documents uh, to, to, uh, to reach the conclusion that this outbreak have, uh, have stopped. So this is very good news. Yeah. that you're giving us and you're, you feel happy and confident about this news. Absolutely, this is a very good news. Uh, actually stopping an outbreak in, a, in a, a country like Syria, we need all to celebrate this achievement. And I'm saying this with, uh, with, uh, with a little bit, uh, being a little bit cautious because in the same time we're still having the risk uh, of, of uh, limited access. Uh, we still have uh, some pockets of uh, flow immunity inside Syria as well as people are moving around uh, in the country and out of the country. And you know, with, with people are moving around, the polyvirus is moving with them. They, the polyvirus doesn't need a passport to, uh, to go through the borders, so it's, it's also moving. So we still have this risk. We still have the routine immunization system inside Syria. It's still being revitalized. It's still not yet uh, reached a level that we are so confident that uh, uh, it will take up, uh, the, take the responsibility from now on. And how does one conduct outbreak response in a place, in a, in a war-torn country? Yeah, actually, this is a this is a very very complicated uh, picture, and that, let me try to simplify this uh, in, in the terms. I just would like to take you to the streets of Derzor and thinking about. Uh, the vaccinators there, the volunteers, that were, they were trying to knock uh, on the doors and trying to convince the families to vaccinate their children. Uh, it, was a, it was an excellent uh, example of, of coordination and stakeholder engagement where people on the ground vaccinated children, independent monitoring, people trying to double check on the quality of vaccination campaigns, as well as people sitting in the, in the country office trying to do micro planning for the campaigns. It's also the regional offices trying to sit and analyze data that's coming from the field and headquarters people try to support with standard of procedures and technical expertise. It is, it is, the, it is the teamwork that we're able to stop this virus. And, uh, and it's absolutely uh, heroic uh, work by the field people to try to uh, really work with this difficult uh, situation. Uh, also, it is, it is good to mention that uh, the health-seeking behavior of the Syrian uh, uh, Syrian families, uh, Syria and the Middle East uh, in general, in my experience in the region, have a very good uh, uh, awareness of the importance of the vaccines, and they have a high demand for for vaccine uh, for the preventable diseases, uh, vaccine preventable diseases. So as soon as we reach access, basically, we are. Uh, we have we have already when when the when the when the battle against the virus because uh, it is it's a matter of access it's a matter of reaching these children uh, with this high with this high demand for vaccine. Speaking of access, I mean some of these areas are controlled by Daesh or ISIS. 
how how did we operate there? How did we get things done? So basically, as a, as a uh, as as a as a partnership, uh, basically the one common objective is reaching the children and having uh, improving the health of the children. I think sitting on the ground and the partnership have uh, a long experience in dealing with such complex situations, areas with conflict uh, zones and, and trying to navigate for improving the health of the children. I think starting from looking at what exactly we have as a public health infrastructure on the, uh, on the field and try to uh, map all the stakeholders and all the partners who is working in the, in the health system and trying to work with all of them in order to reach uh, a plan where we vaccinate every, every, child, every child in, uh, in these areas. It is, it's very important that uh, some people have different agendas, some groups have different agendas, especially with the local authorities and non-state actors like ISIS, for example. It is, it's very difficult to work with these people. But as soon as we reach a common objective is to improve the, 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 the health of the children, it's, it's, it's uh, not as uh, difficult as we can imagine. And looking forward, how can, what, what conditions led to this outbreak so that we can try and avoid them? next time so so basically Syria have been deprived of uh, some areas of Syria as we did not have access to and there's a lot of people who have been deprived of vaccines since since many years and uh, with, with with the health system the devastated health systems with a, such a protect, protracted disaster uh, it is it is uh, it is all these are factors that build up to the to this hap uh, this outbreak happening I think also it is it is very important that the, again the population movement, people moving all over the areas, and with the outbreaks we are having in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nigeria, and and uh, and Horn of Africa, we can we still have uh, a fragile uh, area for the for the polyvirus to survive there. Uh, so uh, I think w what we can do to avoid this is is again three things. The first of all, we need to build, uh, to strengthen our surveillance system. And I can see uh, some hope looking at the surveillance system now is stronger in Syria with having, not only having a stronger system, but as well as with supplementary uh, strategies like health, uh, healthy children sampling or AFP contact sampling, environmental sampling, now with, with 13 sites inside Syria where we are having weekly uh, samples. Uh, also to try to build the immunity of the children. Uh, if, we, if we reached a, a Syrian uh, country with, with immunity levels that are high, the polyvirus, even if it's going there, they, they, will not be, uh, they are not welcomed in the body of the children. Uh, so uh, in addition to the surveillance and the immunization, it's also very important to, uh, to try to strengthen the health, uh, health systems. It is always we are saying that the, the, the vaccination system is, is a part of the overall health system. So improving the health access, uh, trying to repair the health system in Syria is, is, is a must also. Are there any final comments you'd like to share with us? And I think uh, as, as a final comment, it's, uh, it's all reflecting back on the, on the polio uh, program experience. It is, it is very important uh, to, try to, to try to push for eradicating this uh, paralyzing disease. I, I, can, I can see today that we have a few cases and we are almost reaching a success story with this uh, eradicating this disease. However, if we stop now, uh, uh, trying with all these efforts, I think it is it will be sad to see after 10 years again another 200,000 children paralyzed with uh, and uh, unable to walk for life. Five to 10 percent out of them are, are uh, maybe die from infection, and and uh, it is it's horrible story. However, I, I think a lot to be learned from the smallpox uh, story. Uh, I've, I've, uh, a vaccine preventable disease that it's no longer now. It's it's like the polio before. Uh, just thanks to the uh, Dr. Edward, a small town uh, country doctor who was invented this this vaccine in 1976. It is it's a heroic that today we don't have that smallpox uh, virus. So hopefully polio will be like smallpox uh, very soon. Hopefully. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for your time. Thank you to the audience, and we hope to see you soon for another episode of Coffee with Polio Experts. Thank you very much. Thank you.